Please welcome President and COO of the Television Academy and the Television Academy Foundation, Maury McIntyre. Thank you. Good evening. On behalf of the Television Academy Foundation, welcome to the latest in our ongoing series focused on the power of TV. Tonight's discussion revolves around possibly the largest underrepresented community in the entertainment industry, people with disabilities. And we are thrilled to be partnering tonight with uh, Easter Seals, an organization that has been championing what makes us different and the same for 100 years now. Uh, I'd actually like to bring out, uh, before we start, uh, an Easter Seals board member. He is also the founder of the Easter Seals Disability Film Challenge. Please welcome Nick Novicki. Yay. Thank you so much, Amori. I, I, I really appreciate it. And, and thank you so much to the TV Academy Foundation, right? This is, uh, this is so amazing, the partnership with Easter Seals tonight. We really appreciate it. It's just so exciting to be out here. Uh, we are at the TV Academy, man. I'm feeling fancy. I don't know. Anyone else feel like they end up representing Game of Thrones here? Or brown air guy joke? Uh, no, it, it is exciting to be here. Uh, as Maury said, my name is Nick Novicki. I'm the founder and director of the Easter Seals Disability Film Challenge, a weekend film competition, thank you, where we help uh, provide uh, opportunities for people with disabilities and we have some talented people out here. I'm also a board member of Easter Seals Southern California and I'm really proud to be on the board. And this is just so exciting to be here because tonight this is all about celebrating diversity and disability inclusion. And it, we really need this, this is important. People with disabilities, are the largest minority population. One in four Americans has a disability. 61 million Americans. We're also the most underrepresented. You know, we're in less than 3% of film and TV shows with less opportunities behind the camera. You know, so this is really important. And ultimately, this, this is what, what better way than to partner with the TV Academy? You know, because ultimately, we want to be continuing to create these opportunities for people with disabilities. TV has an amazing ability to uh, affect social change and, and change people's influence. So there is no better partnership than with TV. And I know some of you guys are, are thinking, well, well, why Easter Seals? What's Easter Seals connection? Well, Easter Seals is the nation's largest disability services organization. We've been around for 100 years changing uh, the way people view and, and see disabilities. This is our 100th year anniversary. We're celebrating the centennial, okay? And, and I can tell you this, we are gonna continue to be there for the community for the next 100 years. Yeah, and, that, and, and, and it's, just, it's just exciting. You know, the, all the energy is here. And ultimately, as I said, Easter Seal's mission, one of the main parts of our mission is to change the way the world views and defines disabilities. And, and we've been doing that by changing stigmas, perceptions, and ultimately just making the world a more inclusive place. So I, I really feel like we're gonna be able to continue doing that. And Easter Seals has really been showing their commitment uh, their commitment with the Media Access Awards, with the Easter Seals Disability Film Challenge. And we are gonna keep going together. Okay, before I leave, I just wanna give a very special shout out. This Saturday, we are gonna give our live announcement. We're gonna screen the films and give a live announcement from the Newport Beach Film Festival of the 2019 Easter Seals Disability Film Challenge finalists. I just wanna congratulate all of those participants, 71 amazing films. Hundreds of people with disabilities, many of you are out here, and you are about to see some amazing speakers. So I don't want to take up any more of your time, but thank you so much for being involved and being committed. And let's keep moving together, and we can really make a difference. Thank you. Thank you, Nick, so much. And thanks again to Easter Seals for your partnership on tonight's presentation. We really, really do appreciate it. And one more time, a big round of applause. Congratulations, Easter Seals, on 100 years of phenomenal work.
you know, both the Academy and the Foundation feel that uh, events such as tonight's are incredibly important because there is no better medium than television that can advocate with such impact on behalf of the unheard and the underrepresented. Uh, I was at an event a few weeks ago where uh, Emmy-nominated actress Tracy Ellis Ross spoke, and she really broke it down into pretty simple terms. Small screen, big responsibility. Whether you are watching on that large flat screen in your home or via that small screen that's in your pocket right now, television can deliver a message that is pervasive and powerful, broadening perspectives, introducing viewers to different cultures, different ideas, and really just enhancing our understanding of race, gender, orientation, and ability. I wanna to thank tonight's uh, panelists for being with us tonight. We, we cannot do these events without their participation, and we're really, really grateful, so if we get a round of applause before they come out. And now it is my pleasure to introduce an award-winning author, actress, and philanthropist. Please welcome our moderator for this evening, Holly Robinson-Pete. Can you guys hear me? Oh, now I'm up. Now I'm up. I'm so excited to be here. This is such a great panel. Um, many of you may know me. If you don't know me, um, I'm an actress. I've been around a, a minute. Um, <laughs> that's a blessing. Uh, but more than that, I'm the mother of a, a child with autism. He's now 21, and we did uh, a, a pretty cool thing at the time, it was a hard sell to the family to do a reality project for Hallmark Channel called Meet the Peets um, because I wanted there to be more representation of autism in the media. And we always see people playing characters with autism, but we don't often see people with autism just, just doing them, right? So RJ has become an, an autism rock star. So everywhere we go, he, people are always talking about him and he's a very reluctant hero. But I just am so happy that there are autism families that get to turn on the TV and actually see a kid with autism just be himself. So I am so thrilled to be here on this panel, and I'm excited to introduce you to all of our panelists. Are you ready to meet everybody? Yeah. All right. Well, let's start off with attorney, scholar, and activist Catherine Perez. Hi, Catherine. Uh, founder of Buna Murray Productions, executive producer of Born This Way, Jonathan Murray. <laughs> Creator, writer, and star of This Close, Shoshana Stern. <laughs> Actor from Breaking Bad and now, uh, and now Apocalypse, another RJ. R.J. Mitty. Yay! Executive producer and showrunner of Grey's Anatomy, Krista Vernoff. And last but not least, a very dear friend of mine who I haven't seen in a minute, so this is really awesome to be here with him, actor from NCIS New Orleans, Daryl Chill Mitchell. <laughs> Jill Mitchell. So, is everybody want to just do a little mic check? You want to start with that, Catherine? You want to do a little mic check? Just make sure you're up. Go. Yeah, there you are. I am. Jonathan. Yeah, I'm. I'm here. You shouting everybody out? <laughs> Shoshana. Yeah, <laughs> you're here. Her, she's RJ. Good. Yeah, allegedly. Um. <laughs> Krista. Hi. Hi. Does it work? Yeah, it's yeah. Up. chill. It's about that time for us to get off. So cut the ride and get <laughs> out of the horse to count down. Begun is the groove, the chill surprise. You don't see nothing all of a sudden. The curtain rise. Groove and I take a step to the podium. Yes, yeah, working. <laughs> <laughs> Once it starts, it can't stop. <laughs> so, so let, you know what? What I wanted to do is just give a, a general question. Please just chime in, um, and then we'll get to some specific questions. Um, each of the programs represented by our panel treat disability in just the way we're hungry for. Showing disabilities as part of someone's life, uh, but not the entirety of it. 
uh, your characters or the characters you've created uh, have rich, complicated existences and experiences and trials and successes and failures that are often disconnected from the disabilities. How can portraying a character who may have a disability authentically change the narrative? Who wants that one? Okay, I'm calling you out. Catherine, you first. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Hi everyone, so <clears throat> if you don't remember what show I'm on, that's because I'm the least glamorous person up here. <laughs> oh. But you have the best shoes. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> These little glitz is Hollywood. Right? Um, so I am on this panel to keep it rooted um, with the common folk of <laughs> disabled activists and policy makers, although I'm really honored to be um, with such a prestigious group of folks who are making wonderful changes in Hollywood and media for people with disabilities. Um, can you repeat the question again? Oh, no. <laughs> just, it, just how can portraying a character who may have a disability authentically just change the narrative of a program? You gave her the hardest one. I know. <laughs> you, want me, you want me to skip you, come back to you? Sure, skip. Yeah, okay. You all right, I'll jump in. Please, I'm loud. I, I have a loud mouth. I'm loud mouth. Uh, um, is that right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I am not an actor anymore, so I can't speak to the portrayal, but I can speak to the power of representation in television. I, I have seen it happen time and again that by normalizing that which we consider somehow not normal, we, we've only presented one type of person on television for so many decades that one type of person is what is considered normal and acceptable. And it feeds into a really broken system that leads to endless unconscious bias. Mm -hmm. Representation matters so much more, I think, than we're even aware. And so when we hear the statistic that people living with disabilities is like the, what did he say? It's the most common minority. Yeah. And, and you then you look at how many people are actually being represented. People aren't seeing themselves. Mm -hmm. People get empowered through seeing themselves represented and other people feel more comfortable with that minority by seeing them represented on television. And so the failure to represent diversity of all sorts to include people of all types in our storytelling is a wrong that all of us who are working now in Hollywood have to work to make right. I agree with everything she just said. <laughs> and I will add, I think an important part of your question was not just representation, but authentic representation. So folks with disabilities have been everywhere in history. You just gotta look for it. Um, and also we've been in Hollywood for a while too, but we've been represented in a different light than I think we're up here advocate, advocating for today, right? Um, so authentic representation means moving away from the pity model, moving away from the bad and sad <laughs> narratives, what we in the academic space called the medical model of disability, um, and moving toward more of a social model of disability, of celebrating disability, of viewing disability as a community, a culture, um, a, a political minority. Um, so that authentic representation means, well, implicates a lot of things, but it means um, portraying people with disabilities, um, like you were saying, just how we live in everyday life. Mm -hmm. You know the... Right, right. The 2018 GLAD report, I think it was re referenced earlier, it showed that only 2.1% of series regular characters are people with disabilities. And that breaks down to a whopping 18 characters. Mm. Um, what do you want to see uh, in the future when it comes to disability representation behind and in front of the camera? Well, one of the things for me is, uh, you know, you would think when people see me, they go, man, you're the only black actor on television in a wheelchair. And that's like, you, I'm not proud of that. That's like unreal. Mm -hmm. Like to be the only. And it's like when you and, and when you you know it's a bigger world out there. I travel everywhere. I travel outside the, the country and you see people that's just like, they're like me. 
And it's just like they're not being represented. It's, that is scary, but just to be on television. And you, you know, it's a lot of talented actors. And see, the interesting thing for me is I did 15 years of my career walking mm -hmm. and then did the other 15. So now it's, it's crazy how people go, because I also do Fear the Walking Dead, and they go, how would a person in a wheelchair survive in an apocalypse? <laughs> <laughs> I oh, we said, got let skills. me tell you something. I said, I tell people, I said, you know what? I was a zombie one time, too. <laughs> and I say that about people that's ignorant to the facts. Yeah. Because I'm like, yeah, I, I looked at a lot of things differently. So now that I had heard, I'm like, oh, no, I'm not a zombie no more. You the zombie. I don't have the problem. You got the problem. You see things different. <laughs> so that's how I look at it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I agree with what you said. Like, a lot of people really take pride in saying, wow, you're the first. You're the only. And I think in 2019, then we should actually be ashamed of that. We should hey. be ashamed of uh, our lack of perspective. Um, of representation, and it's the only, it's only happening in front of the camera. It's, it's you know, on the page, our characters are two-dimensional, and we have to stretch the page uh, in front of the camera to show the whole world, and that has to happen by people being behind the camera, in front of the camera. We have to talk about who's telling the story, what the audience wants, what the motivation is for the character, and if that character has a disability, can change the narrative, then I think that's, uh, doesn't change the narrative, that it's a bad narrative. I think people already live in the world everywhere. There's every possible situation. There's every possible job, even zombies. You know, we don't see them. We don't see them because we're looking at our own reflection in the window that TV is supposed to reflect back to us. But we are not seeing through that window our own reflection. Um, so we have to focus on the actual person being mm. portrayed. And then we can fulfill fill the, have a full 360 degree representation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jonathan, what do you, what do you think is the key? So you come from the executive producer standpoint. Um, is it a hard sell to, to get this kind of representation? Uh, is it when you go, when someone, when you take a pitch to a network or something, is it, it if you were to, you know, cast someone in a wheelchair or someone with some other kind of disability, is that something that a network or a studio will be like less inclined to do? What do you think is that? What's the pushback? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I'm also involved with a disability organization called Respectability, and we actually did some focus groups with people who work in the industry. And there was actually a person who works in casting who said, "Well, if I cast someone in a wheelchair." as a waitress, people would be asking, well, why is that waitress in a wheelchair? They wouldn't be, they would be distracted. So if you have that kind of mindset, you know, you have to, that took a long time for that person to put themselves in that position. So we have to get by that. And then by the way, the office that she's in, there has to be elevator access for the person in the wheelchair. You know, it just can't be a set of stairs. So there's a lot of just institutional and, and systematic, uh, issues that we have to work through. But when I go to a network, um, I, you know, I, I think there's an openness, but there's also, you know, I, I think it works best when um, you can include people who have um, disabilities in roles where their disability isn't any reason why they're, you know, they're a doctor who happens to be in a wheelchair, or they're a teacher who happens to um, be deaf. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's where you want to be. You know, it, it, it's, it's interesting, on NCIS New Orleans, they had me actually in a vest, it's NCIS, I'm out on location, out helping solve the crime. I'm solving, I'm doing the computer stuff. We are standing out, I'm sitting there with them with guns, we, the enemy is on the other side. Now, who I'm going to catch? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but <clears throat> in the same thing, when I did the movie with Spike and Denzel Inside Man, I was doing the intel on the truck. Nobody questioned it. They, you you want to see, I think part of it is because they knew me as an actor before. So I think it erases that stigma. But the fact is, 
you know, you wouldn't see that. But nobody, you see what you want to see. Mm -hmm. And you do what you want to do. Mm -hmm. If you want to see it, you'll see it. Right, and that's right. just, that's just the reality. Because I'm, 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 I'm thinking like, you know, with the intel, nobody questioned nothing. I'm outside and on, on location. We, you know, I'm, I, my job is to do intel in, in, in the office. And they bring me outside. Now I'm doing this. Now I'm outside in a vest. I ain't got no gun. <laughs> I ain't killing nobody. Right. But I'm just saying the fact that if they, but NCIS is like, you know what? They do it, and they, we just put it out there. Yeah, that's great. And nobody says anything, so it can't be done. Yeah. I find the people have a weird habit, and this is for a lot of the people in the industry, but worldwide, is, is we overthink things. Yes. And we underthink the most important things. Like, more often than not, continuity. Like, we, we, oh, we'll fix that later. And that's something that for a long time has been this, this part, this issue that we're combating is like, oh, we'll, 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 we'll put it in a later season or we'll fix that in this season or, well, yeah, I guess. I guess, I guess we've seen the chat and we saw the conversation enough. I guess we have to do it eventually. And that's kind of where for a lot of time the industry and network has kind of been at is, yeah, we get it, it's important. But eh, I mean, we'll catch up to it. Mm -hmm. and, and we've caught up to it. And we have the artists, we have the people, we have the insight, and we have to actually come together. And everyone here, you know this conversation. You're hearing things, you're agreeing with it because you know this is, this is a prevalent conversation. This is a conversation we all understand. And if you don't, welcome. Um, <laughs> and, and it's something though that we need to stop overthinking and start realizing what is important and what is a need. Or, do we want to hire our friends, but do we need to hire this actor? And we need, we need to hire people like you. We need to hire the individuals that are in this room that, that create that first person to pioneer them, to bring everyone with that. Because someone that has to be the first person. We have many people in this room that have done things for the very first time in not just your life, but in this world. And that may not be recognized and that may not be seen but that's not the importance. The importance is that you made that impact, you broke that shield, and now allow and allow everyone to grow with that and, and teach that point. Yeah. Excellent point. Um, you know, I think I, I think there's just a lot of fear, and that fear is often misinterpreted, pun intended. <laughs> um, but it's misinterpreted because I think it's the fear of something that I don't know. And it becomes like, I've noticed when uh, the networks, we approach networks and various businesses, it's this fear of the unknown and a rejection of it. And I think it's that fear. Fear can be a good thing because it reminds you that you can't make art alone. It takes a village. And the only way to make something, to have people all around, you know, with who are talented, it's really about fear has to serve as a reminder that collaboration is so critical and we have to invite everybody into the room to share their experience. Yeah. Maybe you know another writer has experience. Can't bring them in. Um, and even with crew. That's so important, you know. Mm -hmm. I feel like representation in front of the camera, writing, producing, I think we're making strides. And I'm proud of the strides that we're making. Yeah. But still, when I go on set and I see crew, most are white men, able-bodied, and I don't know why that is. Why? Um, Wise guy. Why not hire people with disabilities who we can't? You know, why not hire? Seven, I hired 17 deaf people on the set of this close, to who worked both before in front of and behind the camera. Because I said to myself, why not? Hmm. The crew, you know, is the continuity in our work. They keep us stable. You know, we have the same people in Los Angeles doing the crew, and sometimes people there are lots of people ready to work, hungry to work. And they would be so grateful for the job. You know, why not? Only 52% of deaf Americans have employment. 52% of deaf people in America 
They just need a chance. And if we don't hire them, they don't have the chance. And then they'll be the first person there in the morning, the last person there to leave if we just give them the chance. We can't let that fear drive us. It has to become the reminder and the motivation that collaboration is the key. We have to welcome them in. We have to learn. That's the only way we're going to learn and grow. Well, she, you, just, you just opened up a story that I told Holly. I was going to tell Holly, right? I don't, I don't surprise you. It's an interesting thing. This, I'm, one of the blessed situations for me is being able to have this job on NCIS. And my son works on the show. He's been a PA for three years. The best PA. They send a van to pick him up every day and get him. My son has autism. And they, uh, the, the guy Sherman is like, this is my best PA for the set. Because you put him on the job, that's it. <laughs> you shut down the street, he going to shut the street down. <laughs> he told the executive producer, Jim Heyman one day, was coming on. The red light was on. Jim went open the door. He shut the door. He said, rolling me, rolling. <laughs> Yo. All right. He couldn't wait to tell me the story, the, the gym. He said, you know, Desmond locked me out the stage. <laughs> I'd say, hey, he said, you know what? I couldn't do nothing but stay there and wait. <laughs> I, if I, I can't do nothing, teach him wrong. But he loves his job. He's dedicated to his job. And he is there faithfully. And they love him. And it, it, he came in yesterday. Oh, he got picked up. We going again. I was like, let me go in again. So that's Love why I would it. tell you that story. I, you know, you blow me away with that story. Cause yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, that's and my, I love that. Yeah. I love it. My RJ, um, I would say my RJ because I'm sitting Your RJ, you. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> my RJ got a job with the Los Angeles Dodgers, and we, they, we were told he would never have a job. And the, this major league organization hiring my son as a clubhouse attendant changed the complete trajectory of his life. Yes. And, um, and it's just great. It's just just the example of showing how valuable they are to community, how they can work. He's task driven. He what? listen. He knows the name of every single major league umpire. But know it. Nobody knows the umpire's name. <laughs> what? So this guy is just amazing. He, he went from growing up with no friends to having a whole clubhouse dugout full of friends. So it's really beautiful to see. And I love that they hired Desmond because that oh is just gosh. great. I want to ask Three, you a question. Four, yeah. You know, recent. Research uh, indicates that 95% of characters with a disability on primetime television are played by actors without that disability. Mm. Can one of you maybe speak uh, to how the casting process should develop when looking for an actor to play a character who does have a specific ability? Maybe Krista or Jonathan. I mean, uh, just how can we improve that talent pipeline for both on-screen and off-screen roles? to make a television disability inclusive, more, di more inclusive. I can tell you that Linda Lowy, who casts Grey's Anatomy, has, um, this is a, a passion for her, and, and one of the things that she said to me is, write characters with disabilities, but you have to give me an early heads up. The minute you start talking about it in the writer's room, you have to call me, because I need extra time to find the actor with that disability who can also do that part. It, it, and, and I think that that goes to, anytime you wanna change any system that's broken, it requires extra effort. Mm -hmm. And that's why the first answer is always no. That's why the casting director's first impulse is that waitress can't be in a wheelchair. Yes, they would have to make their office accessible, and that's extra work for them. And, and the seeing of the, the, the you often hear the sentence, uh, it limits the talent pool. Don't you want the best actor? And, and you have to go, I want a great actor, and I want it, and I want, ideally, I want an actor who's living with that disability because of the authenticity they'll bring. And I reject the notion that I can't have both. People just have to work harder. And it is harder work, initially, to change a system. But, but I think the work is, is essential. Um, and I wonder where it, you know, I went and saw a play in LA recently that Linda Lowy said, go see this play. These actors are incredible. And then write their, and their actors living with disabilities write parts for them, basically. And the, the actor on stage was playing um, a character with cerebral palsy. Mm -hmm. he, 
he did not have cerebral palsy, but he was a man who lived in, who, who uh, didn't have the use of his legs. So the wheelchair was his wheelchair, but, the, but he doesn't have cerebral palsy. Mm -hmm. And I found myself wondering, like where, what is the, what, what are the guidelines? Was he good? He was great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. He was great. I don't have an issue. But, but would you have an issue if he were an able-bodied white dude in the wheelchair with the cerebral palsy? Was he great? I, I don't know, because... I mean, I got sorry. less of a laugh on that. <laughs> no, I, 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 you know, I think it's a double-edged sword, and I think that there's a fine line. If he's horrible, then yeah, you have a problem, but if he's great, he gets an Oscar. And I think there's a fine line of that... If you want access, if you want access, you can't limit all access. And you have to be able to bring everyone together. Now, should able-bodied actors, should an, a random white guy play that role? No. But if he is undeniably amazing at that character and into that, I can't, I can't refuse that. I, I'm not going to dampen that person's, that person's realm of who he is. If he felt that he had the ability to go out and do that and be that person and live that life, I, I commend him for that. So I'm, I'm almost where RJ is, because I tell people all the time, I, me, because I was an able-bodied actor, and one time I played a stuttering guy, so, and, and that because I had a cousin who stuttered, so I just mimic what I saw. But what I'm saying is, if all I want is to make sure a person with a disability got a chance. Yeah. Long as he got an opportunity, because everybody walking can't act. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a fact. Everybody walking can't act. As long as they get a chance, and I, I try to stay away from it, but I have to. For 30 years I've been doing this. My manager is right here today, which was my agent, and she is a living testament to how many roles that we had to bombard because they wouldn't see me because I was black. Mm, right. And then when I got in the room, I took the job. Mm -hmm. To all her job, I, I always tell her, you get me in the room, I get the job. And, but, and I try to stay away from that conversation, but it's the same fight again. Same fight. <laughs> and I, did, I, I always tell a joke how I used to, I worked so hard doing mainstream television because I'm like, I'm doing these mainstream projects. I had a motorcycle accident, get in a wheelchair, black all over again. <laughs> Yeah. Cause now it's a going new war. I'm now in the same war, but different yeah. fight. The, now. the difference yeah. also is right now is is we have access to be to to get to these roles. You know, people now more than ever are proactive in their career. They're not relying on the agents and the managers like they used no. to. Like, I I find I actually just had a conversation. I just I just got a movie or in the middle of working on a movie on the ride here. My yeah. agents, my managers have no idea I have it. <laughs> <laughs> like it, it. Same thing. I had an audition. I had an audition. Oh, today, with the production team. My the production team I met with. I actually had a meeting on Saturday, Sunday with them. They by circumstance. It's being proactive and putting that out there, and not accepting that no, not accepting that oh this is an able body role or this is this role. Show up. Go on on LA Casting, find a role that fits you, that, that is not defined by your appearance or how you act, but what you are going to contribute to that role. And it could be anything. And that's the key in this, is, is where we used to have to go through the agents. The, the manager had to talk to the agent, the agent had to talk to the casting director, the casting director had to talk to the directors and the showrunners and all the other people. Now, we're in a time where I could go online, I could follow my favorite directors, actors, casting directors, showrunners. You could go to IMDb, pull up a list of a show, and follow every single producer and background person on that show and get into that. And, you know, a lot of people here, you were realizing, like, oh my God, why haven't I thought of that before? It's so simple. And it's changed. The game has changed. But it's now in our court. It's in your court. It's in anyone that wants to be a part of it, be a part of it and make it happen. Don't let 
a role define you. You define that role. Because a lot of things, yeah, uh, yeah. a lot of um, roles that I went and read for, that like even with NCIS, they only wanted me for two episodes. And here we are six years later. Oh, yeah. Okay. So I'm I just saying, you, you, what he's saying is, that, is, you know, in certain things I went out uh, for a pilot, it was a female teacher. And she was able-bodied. I went in, they changed it, made a black guy in a wheelchair. <laughs> so it's just, you know, it's a matter of you go and get in there. And, and I, like I tell, I don't show up for audition. I show up for work. Yeah, that's that. my attitude. I show up yeah. for work. Yeah. And that's and and but just about being proactive. That's a, a, a part of it. But at I the just, same time, yeah, I want to play sure. devil's advocate because mm -hmm. these two are very outgoing actors. Um, I actually think it's a little problematic to argue that, hey, if the guy's good in the role, then yeah, we're okay with an able-bodied person playing the disabled role. Um, and, and sort of pushing this narrative, maybe I'm getting guys wrong, that you know, disabled actors just need to put themselves out more and you know, there's, there's changes in the industry. It, and maybe I'm wrong I'm because listening. I'm not in no, the no, industry. No, I'm but listening, but that's one, that's one piece to make that extra step. Well, from a policy activist perspective, from a, from a historical perspective, people with disabilities have been left out for so mm -hmm. long in various industries, including Hollywood, that um, I don't think it's easy enough to just tell disabled actors or folks who, disabled folks who want to be actors to just get out there and do it. I think that there are structural issues that really need to be addressed. And I appreciate that you're coming from an actor role. So maybe if, if I were you know, to talk about the other side of it on the casting side, I would say, no, you should try to cast a disabled actor for that disabled role. Um, not only because we need to be more inclusive of people with disabilities, but also I would argue that um, the character is going to be disabled. Maysoon Zaid says this. I, I love it. She says, my character is disabled because I'm disabled. And I think that's right on. I think that what does it mean to play a disabled character? I mean, people with disabilities are so different and unique. I mean. Yeah. How do you play a person of color, right? Um, oh. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, you can, but that's problematic too. Another right? panel. Uh, John. Play a want, woman. How do you play a woman? That, yeah. yeah. I agree completely. It's about life. Yes. It's about life within the character. And if you're acting like somebody's, be, you, that you're in and out of that life, um, and that there's only the truth on camera of that. And then off camera, you know, you're t walking around or you're supposed to be in a wheelchair, you're talking with people, you're supposed to be deaf. There, where's the authenticity to that? Where's the truth? It's not authentic to me if you're not that off camera. I agree with you. John, I wanted to ask you about Born This Way. It's just, it's such a groundbreaking program. Uh, it follows a group of young adults with Down syndrome and they're showing that they have, you know, the same needs, the same wants, and that we all do, living on their own, falling in love, and really connected with it because of my son, and he has several young adult friends with, with Downs, um, getting a job, you know. Why was this important to show? I think it's uh, essential to show because there are young people growing up out there, and they need to have role models mm -hmm. on TV. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, uh, I think that being able to see whether it's a character um, in CSI or whether it's seeing other young people like them on a reality show who are getting jobs, who are falling in love, who are getting married, mm. who are defining their life for themselves with the help of some wonderful parents, that communicates so much to those young people. And then we've actually had, uh, because of Born This Way, We've had people who have um, emailed us that, you know, they found they were pregnant. They were going to have a. They found out they were going to have a child with Down syndrome, and the doctor painted a very dark picture for them. Mm. But they saw Born This Way, and they realized it doesn't have to be dark. Wow. That their child can contribute to their family. That their child can contribute to their community. Yeah, yeah and television is such a tr tremendous platform to. That's one of the reasons I said earlier why we, I forced my family to do this <laughs> reality project. I wanted people to see an RJ. I wanted people to see a team around him, a family thriving and pushing him to be his best. And 
all the things he was told he would never be able to do. And that's what I love about Born This Way. I have many friends with, with Downs and who have children with Downs. And um, one of the, uh, I talk, spoke about the Dodgers earlier, and one of the first Dodger players to come and connect with RJ on his very first day at work, and he was so nervous, was Jock Peterson. And Jock has a, an older brother with Downs. And Champ and RJ connected, and they've been these, these great friends. If you don't get to see that, if there's no representation of that, then how do you know that it could be a, a good thing? You know, how do you know that there's all these nuances? Exactly. Yeah. And for me, um, you know, where so many people now with reality shows, they come up ready to sort of play a character and, and, and deliver something to you, the freshness that this group of people, you know, the stories that we got to tell, um, were just so fresh and enriching, not only hopefully for our audience, but the crew. Yeah. We had people fighting to be on this show because of the power of that experience. Really, uh, crew members that yeah, wanted people, to be on Yeah, people, everybody wants to work on this show because it is just, wow. you, you, you just feel good about what you're doing. Mm. I love that, I love Holly, that. Holly, I wanna add one other thought to how we change this system. Yes. One of the things that we're beginning to do on Grey's Anatomy is say, please submit actors with disabilities for this random patient character. Like, why are we only seeing able-bodied people? There's nothing about this patient who says he can't be deaf. There's nothing about this patient who says he can't be blind. He's got appendicitis. Yeah. Like, people with disabilities have appendicitis. Right. And it's like the kind of thing where like, why is that a new idea? <laughs> you know? okay. but, I, but, but I think part of it is that we all work so hard and we all work so many hours and we all wanna do the thing that's easiest and takes the least amount of time. So let's pick yeah. one race and one type of person and submit all of that type of person and then compare them to each other. I, I hope and, and, and pray to God that we just did an episode of NCIS New Orleans that I, I, me is, I felt like I didn't have to do nothing else after this because every guest star was disabled. Mm, wow. And we had to solve a crime. Mm. Wow. And not only the, the actors, but we had, because we I played rugby and, and I mean, we played rugby. And they had the paraplegic team from Paralympics. So we had a lot of those guys, a lot of disabled veterans, and it opened up the minds of the crew they started, and it was so crazy because after they said, all right, we rap, you should see the whole crew running trying to get into the chair so they can crash. Yeah. They wanted, now they wanted to see how this thing is going. And you see crew members go, man, I don't watch sports, but I tell you, I watch this. <laughs> I don't watch it. But I'm just, I'm saying, I hope to God that opens because every guest star we had on there from Kurt, Jaeger, uh, yeah. Till, everybody was, we had disabled veterans, dis amputees, paraplegic, quadriplegic, and we shot inside of a rehab center. So they told them, anybody want to be on the show, be here this week. So even the people, the extras, were all disabled, the whole episode. So it was just like I got the real question for you, though. How's your rugby skills? I'm nice. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Nice. Nice player. Nice. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, Krista, again, I wanted to go back to you, you know, um, Representing disability uh, it authentically isn't always easy to do. Uh, do you recall like a scene or an episode where you felt like we really got this right? Well, we did a storyline this year on Grey's Anatomy where um, Catherine was diagnosed with cancer. And uh, we told that story because we have a writer who lives with stage four cancer. And she said, I'm really tired of cancer diagnosis being um, like either you live and you're well mm. or you die. Mm. She's living with a disability and she doesn't see it represented on television. And she said, I wanna tell that story. And I said, <laughs> tell that story, like write it. You wanna tell that story? Tell that story. And she wrote two of the most powerful episodes we've ever done. And, and in terms of, uh, you know, we didn't hire an actor living with cancer to play that role because it was a, one of our series regulars who was being diagnosed with the condition. The choice to have it be one of our series regulars diagnosed with the condition allowed us to continue telling the story mm. of that character mm. living with that cancer we, as, as Finchie lives with mm -hmm. the cancer. So we were really, really proud of that. Um, 
this season we also we we were telling a story about a disabled veteran who was having a a penis and scrotum transplant. Oh. And we learned that um, most veterans who need that surgery um, have lost one or both legs. So we found an actor who, who'd lost a leg. We, we, it, we couldn't specifically find an actor who needed a penis and scrotum transplant, but we found <laughs> an actor uh, who... Uh, who um, How hard did you try? <laughs> <laughs> We'll we did not put that breakdown out, um, but uh, but but we found an actor who was living who'd, who'd lost his leg in in recent years, and um, and I don't know if we got it really super right, but I do think that he brought when he talked about what it was to 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 go through this accident and and mm -hmm. and what and the. Um, the, the, the pain was really palpable. Sure. The truth sure. of his story, uh, as that actor delivered it, was was really palpable. And I, 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 I got was, it right. You got it right. I felt like we got it right. Um, <laughs> yeah. Shoshana, this close is a show about the lives of and loves of two best friends who happen to be deaf. Uh, you and your writing partner Josh dreamt this idea up over happy hour. Yes. And shot it yourselves. Can you, how did you uh, create a path from webisodes to being picked up at Sundance? Tell us a little bit about how that happened. Sure, yeah. So Josh is my writing partner. And the two of us, we came up with the idea. And we pitched it. But the original idea was two best friends, one only one of them being deaf. And that was my character. The other character, the best friend, was hearing. And because of that reason... Um, it is uh, so conditioned to see people on TV, one, on screen, one deaf and one hearing. And that's always been what it's mm -hmm. been like. We've never seen two deaf characters on screen together. So uh, typically when that happens, you're, you know, deafness doesn't become visible. It's almost like your character because how you communicate with the other person is, is what language you choose and all that. Um, uh, can the other person sign, or is it pretend like they know they sign, but they really don't? <laughs> you know, and deaf people can see all of this, and that's typically what was shown on screen. So we were pitching it because we thought, well, that's what the only way we were ever going to get to do it is if one of the characters is hearing and one is deaf. Mm -hmm. And we came so close to selling the show that way, but we got a lot of uh, passes. And over the course of time, we started thinking to ourselves, you know, we don't want to do it this way because. Why is it that the character, why can't both characters be deaf? There really isn't a reason. Right. You have to have, do we have to have a reason? What, you know, we have two characters who are both hearing, why not? So, and it wasn't, there was no conversation about it. It was just like, you know, we said that we don't want to do it this way. And so this is why we were like, oh gosh, you know, um, we were sitting at happy hour, drowning our sorrows in a couple of drinks because we're like, this show is never going to sell and we can't tell them. We're going to have to show them. We can't just tell them. They're not going to buy it. Um, we have to do it ourselves and then show it. So we're going to do this. We're going to shoot it ourselves. And I thought, what well, if we do it ourselves, why don't we just balls to the walls, do it? Balls to Let's the walls. Let's both deaf because if we don't do it, who will? No one will. I love it. No one will. So why not? Why not just do it? So we shot it in a day for 250 bucks, and we put it on YouTube. And then a production company saw it on YouTube. And, uh, you know, I think that's the whole key. Show it, not tell it. I don't want to explain it to someone. Hey, this is why this is important. It's going to be important that you see two deaf people together because, you know, that's what we've done all that time. And it, people weren't interested in it. But it was only when they saw it mm -hmm. portrayed that they could say get interested. And then we shot it again with the, with the other pro production company. And then we got that, that longer things uh, into Sundance into the film festival, and uh, that's where Sundance now, the streaming network, um, they uh, went to our, uh, uh, they went to a program for another show, they went to go buy a different show, but they saw ours, and they ended up passing on the first one that they went to go buy, because that ended up, um, what, sell, what sold the show is, that's the, uh, when the other production company said no to start with, that came full circle, and then ended up. Selling our show that way. Can I just say thank you? I want, I want, I want to say something. I want to say something. I want to say something. 
Oh, just, I'm next. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> just, just this is the point what we're trying to make about television and people. When she makes a point, everybody does this instead of doing this. She can't hear this. You see that? It's just, um, and, then you're, and, you're not, and you're not being mean. It's just what your natural instinct is telling you to do. I'm sitting there doing this every time. But y'all automatically, let's practice. <laughs> whoa, whoa. <laughs> All right. I, I, I don't mind. I honestly I know, don't I know she don't. I, just, I, I know I'm making a point to them. Tell I'm just making a point sure. to them. Okay. Not for well, you. thank you. I just, because this, well, this, this is what Hollywood, this is what Hollywood does. Yeah. yeah. This is what they do. They, they automatically, we'll it's say a, something, but they will It's a learning curve. It's what, a learning curve for yeah. sure. Yeah. And then I don't think a lot of times they being mean or just hateful. Unconscious. No. Unconscious. Just, yeah. It's just that, you know, we just, it's like, okay, we get that, everybody. But they, it's like, you just, it's just because we automatically does it. And that's think, I think this is the same thing what happens with Hollywood. Uh, recently, right. um, Catherine, I'm going to get to you. Uh, there has been a strong push from the disability advocacy community for people first language. Um, for those who don't know what that, that means, it it's means leading with the person rather than leading with the disability. Um, person with a disability versus disabled person. Uh, and in many ways, the programs represented by our panelists are person first. So Catherine, can you speak to the, the impact of language um, and media on policy and practice? Sure, and actually, that's a good question for me to, <laughs> what my response is gonna be. How you just said that you wanted to show rather than tell, that power right there is not only the power of your show becoming successful in Hollywood and for entertainment value, but that's the power of Hollywood and media for making real change in the policy realm as well. Look, I can write a bunch of academic papers and the statistics say that only six other academics in their offices are gonna read it, but what you guys do by showing authentic representation is so powerful and is just shaping our policy debate. So thank you, that's important. Um, in terms of person first, mm -hmm. yeah, I think that's right. And I think you've been talking about this all along. I like that analogy. Uh, for those of you who don't know, there's um, been a shift um, in disabled folks like reclaiming how they want to be identified. And there's certain communities within the disability community who prefer um, person first. So for example, um, person, using a wheelchair rather than wheelchair user, or uh, like my sister who has intellectual disability, we say person with intellectual disability rather than intellectually disabled person. Um, this ties in really nicely because I like to disclose in these panels and I haven't done it yet, but I'm, I'm a person with psychiatric disabilities um, instead of saying, I guess, like psychiatrically disabled. Um, and I feel like we've been talking about this too in terms of mm. ha having shows that show just the person and not talking, uh, or not writing the character as a disabled character. Mm -hmm. And that's important, I like that. But I also want to complicate this too, that there are other folks in the community who actually prefer identity first language. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of folks in the autistic community, for example, who just like I said, prefer to be called autistic rather than a person with autism. Um, so I think um, although person first is important and, and I like where, where folks have gone with that, we also need to make sure that when we think about the disability community, um, the general rule of thumb is to ask folks how they want to be identified. Mm. Um, and so language is not going to be static or it's not going to be the same for everyone. It's going to change for all different communities. Um, I mean, the deaf community as well, right? I mean, we don't say people who, yes. who are right. deaf. Hearing we, impaired. Well, some people do. Some I people choose do. to identify as hearing impaired, which is fine but uh, you can't force your diagnosis on somebody. Mm -hmm. So let that person define yeah. themselves, how they wish to be identified, 
and how to identify themselves. So typically we say hard of hearing and deaf, but some people with hearing impairments prefer, uh, you know, if they, that oftentimes it's people who have lost their hearing later and they prefer hearing impaired because they feel that they've actually lost something versus someone who's born deaf. Uh, that person has not lost anything. So um, hearing impaired becomes problematic for them. Mm. So there's really no such thing as a lone wolf representation. You know, I'm the first, I'm the only, I'm the only thing that can represent the entire, uh, you know, population. We have to have space for a lot of representation. So if you want to call yourself a hearing import, impaired person, that's absolutely fine if that's your mm -hmm. choice. And I agree with you 100% to allow the person to choose um, how they wish to be identified. I don't know if you guys saw this article, but um, I think it was like in Australia, there was a mayor who wanted to get rid of the word disabled even and say access inclusion activists or something like that. Um, and, and they made this terrible analogy that um, we're trying to get rid of the word disabled to make it as taboo as the N-word. Um, and I just found that so incredibly problematic and you know, bursted this bubble that I live in of, of, of the disability world and reminded me that I'm like in this 1% who really embraces the term disabled, embraces disability. Um, so on language, um, person first in some spaces is appropriate, but also there's a really big push in our community to Embrace. To embrace mm -hmm. disability, embrace mm -hmm. the term disabled. Um, yeah. And in that way, rewriting how folks understand disability is not something that's negative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, RJ. Yes. So your role on Breaking Bad is one of my favorite characters oh, on television. I just, you just were so good in that. You're so good in that part. Um, I understand that that was the very first time that you played a multifaceted character who was not entirely defined by a disability. That was my first speaking role. Really? Yeah, I was 13 years old, um, 13 turning 14 oh. when I started that show, and uh, I was 20 turning 21 when I finished it. Oh, oh my gosh, that's yeah. I, I was uh, as a I, when I started working as an extra, and I was a, an extra on about. Uh, 13 different shows all at the same time. I was on Hannah Montana, Everybody Hates Chris, Weeds, Seventh Heaven, and a bunch of other movies. Um, and I, uh, yeah, I, I actually never put uh, my, dis my disability on my resume. So anyone that I work with, if they, if they would be like, there's something wrong with this dude. <laughs> <laughs> and then they realized it was just my personality. Um, <laughs> but, um, so was but the yeah. character on Breaking Bad was scripted? Written, yeah, it was written. So Vince Gilligan, and this is this is a testament to individual engagement, which is something that we all have to be aware of and, and engage individuals and not be closed-minded. Because Vince, who Vince Gilligan, the creator of Breaking Bad and, and many other shows and movies, had a friend in college who had cerebral palsy, and he, he used with he used crutches. And uh, a few years after, passed away from complications, not from CP, but from other. Usually, if you have CP, it usually comes with a few other disabilities and challenges along the way that people face. Um, it's just one of, of many God's gifts. And, uh, but, uh, but that allowed him to have that insight in creating Walt Jr. Mm. So, yeah. Very, very cool. Um, now, the role of... Is it Leif or Leaf? Leif. 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 And Leif. now Apocalypse. That was created with you in mind? That was created with me in mind. I don't know if many people have seen the naked people on the buses. That's, <laughs> that's us, now Apocalypse. Um, but yeah, I, I play a character named Leif, who uh, is a sculptor. He's an artist. He, he makes big pots for, for <laughs> Hollywood uh, moguls, not pot, not weed, but pot. <laughs> we got, we got to be specific. And uh, ends up meeting this girl at a party, who's the lead character, played by um, Kelly uh, Bergling, who is on Lab Rats and all, and, and a bunch of other shows. And and yeah, she's amazing. I play a love interest. I, I'm not entirely sure how my character is connected into this world because it's about like angels and demons and lots of sex <laughs> and, um, um, and uh, it, it's very fun and, and you know both the shows have a taboo about them 
you know, Breaking Bad, you know, we weren't very received. The Academy received us and, and critically received, but as a whole, people were very anti Breaking Bad. I, I used to, we would get death threats and all kinds of stuff, and it was, what? yeah, because we were glorifying methamphetamine. Oh. <laughs> and, you know, it, it's, it's one of those, uh, it's not the same thing, but like disability, it's one of those, there's a bigger, a bigger thing there. There's a bigger community there, and, and, there's, a, and there's such a rampage of methamphetamine, and at the time, no one was aware of it. Mm -hmm. So it was very touchy and people people didn't want to get to it and like this the the sex and 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 kind of the promiscuit um promiscuous promis promiscuity promiscuity <laughs> that's what i was looking for uh is uncomfortable to some people and it, it's something that well rj let me ask you disabled people have sex <laughs> oh, oh, dude, disabled people have sex, man. You, you don't even know. Oh, I you don't know. even know. I, I, yeah, I ain't even getting involved in that one. <laughs> I, so I, I'm, they're very similar in a way where they're being received, but I'm very lucky that it's, it's not about, so in both, my character has CP. And in now Apocalypse, my character has CP. Um, and I said both, but again... Um, but it's just an aspect. It's not what defines my character. It's not who my character is. Well, the character that I'm playing the love interest for has dated a guy with CP before, so we know what her kink is. Um, uh, but uh, but it, it, it's there, and it's one aspect, and I think that's something that more shows. And this conversation, as this conversation has grown over the, the decades, People get it, or people don't. And now, and and it's okay if you don't, but you have to you have to grow with that. That's a that's an old ideology. That's that's something that's it doesn't work in this day and age. And the people that are getting it are creating stuff for this. They're they're creating and stepping out of that box. And luckily, I, I've seen more of that than than not um, over my career. I'm I'm fairly segregated myself in the community um, but um, but it's a very special show and I'm very lucky to, to have to have it excellent excellent um, I wanted to just uh, go back to solutions talking about solutions on how to get you know a little bit more what can we individually each do to get more diversity in inclusion, what can we do? Um, everybody has a voice. Everybody's used their platforms in pretty amazing ways. Everybody's advocating. What else can we do? Is there anything else that we can do? One of the things I, I find, I just, it, it seems like everybody is pushing their own position. Like, oh, I'm just for the wheelchair. I'm just for the, Deaf, I'm just for the blind. Instead of us doing a a a, a community, a, a full community. community, a full community. That's yeah. what that's what I want to see more mm -hmm. I do of too. that. That what I want to see that yeah. togetherness. Because yeah. everybody, you know, it, why why you know she got to be doing a pilot with her and another deaf person. Why I can't be with a person in a wheelchair? Me and her, or me and him. Or, you know, just because it ain't like I, I, you know, I got friends that's blind. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so it just, you don't just have to see, it just got to be me in the wheelchair. You know, it wasn't like, you know, people on the show, that's what I like because that episode, it wasn't just people in wheelchairs. There were amputees, there were people on crutches, there were people, you know, that was paraplegic, quadriplegic, just different array of disabilities, not just one particular. You know, yeah. focus. That's the thing that I, I think we need to get more. Can I complicate that. that even further? Um, and disabled people, I don't have to tell you this, but not all disabled people are white either. So <laughs> there's something called intersectionality, um, and the idea that that disability being included on television is not going to be achieved once we have a bunch of white disabled characters. You're missing a whole. Um, part of our population. No, that's, I think that's really Great important point. with Born This Way when we cast that. 
we made an effort to make sure that it was also a diverse cast. So we had a young woman, um, Elena, whose mother came from Japan, and it was shameful to have a disabled child. Mm -hmm. And that storyline, actually, uh, when we first meet her, she's, she's hardly able even to say the word Down syndrome. But mm -hmm. over the course of those four seasons, you see how she comes be to become more comfortable with who she is. Um, and we have a young African American man in the cast, and we have a Latino, and you know, and so it it, it is important to, um, you know, I'm a gay white man, and for so many years, any kind of gay representation was always the white guy, <laughs> and you know, it shouldn't be that way, mm -mm. right? And the masculine white guy. Are you saying something about me? <laughs> <laughs> Really no, I'm saying that that uh, every Very head yeah. row oh, of you. <laughs> <laughs> but I do think that one thing we can all do is use our relationships to ask questions. It, it like everyone's so busy all the time, and everyone wants to go to the most easy, obvious thing. But be, but Finchie said to me, and she's a, living with a disability, and she's in my writer's room, and she said, "Could we please?" do better with our background actors and mm, representation mm. of disabilities. And it's just a question, and I was like, I'm sure we can. And at the next meeting, I was like, could we do better? <laughs> like, could we do better with this? Could we get some representation? And, it's and hard. It's hard. You know, I, I, I work with elite talent. I work with numerous background agencies. And I actually, I, and, and quite a few of you are here, and I submit people, and I push people out there. And they don't sign up. The the, the artists don't sign up to don't do the background sign up. work. A lot of them, a lot of it, and it's not just just. I'm not just saying people with disabilities aren't signing up. I'm talking about this is every I and people I'm sending to go to work professionally, and, uh -huh. and a lot of times people don't do the legwork, and it's not because of disability. It's just out of sheerness of like they're busy or something like that. Or it's because our culture's been so broken for so but long. But you should be able to you can do it for people. Do Sorry. it for people, you know? Like we have an episode in season two, um uh, well uh, with yeah. RJ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh we said we we reached out, you know, to people that I knew through media access. I said, do you know people? Send us these, because we need mm -hmm. the background actors. And they, people who came that day were so ready to work, because you can't pull yourself up by but, your own bootstrap. But that's, yeah. but you that's don't one, have boots. That's one aspect. Yes. You know, you need boots. We have to, that's the opening of the door. Um, us, we though. build it. It's like, if you build it, they will come. So obviously, you can submit through your agency, through the, through the traditional way, but oftentimes you have to blast or you just have to email and when and people will show up. Mm -hmm. I will. agree with that. And that's but it's we've we've built that community around us that, that we live in, that we see it. And and that's not for the everyday individual. That's not here. Mm -hmm. And that and, and and to get to that reach to build these bridges for everyone to get across, to allow them to actually see it, it, it grows past us. You know, we do a lot in the community, everyone here even. We make impacts, but we're only one person, and we're only one project, and we're only one entity. We, we need to build our bridges broader and to engage more as, as individuals and as a community in that awareness aspect. And it's no testament to the people that I, I sent that didn't sign up, that, that I'm, I'm, they had reasons, and eventually they signed up a couple of years later. Right. Um, but but it's, it's knowing that it's there, and, that, and that's, that's you putting the conversation out there, that's engagement, but it's also you having to do it. You, you have to, we can only, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. And that's one aspect that we always forget. And as much as we want to help, and we want to see it, and we want to believe it, and we want to, and we want to bring people to the threshold of welcome. This welcome to Fantasy Island. Like this is it. This is it. But but eventually they have to walk on the beach. I hear that. We were able to find the actors walking on the beach. We, Good. I asked the question, and the next thing I knew, I was getting Twitter thank yous for representation, and I hadn't even noticed, you know, somebody walking through a scene with a. Yeah, Metal leg. Leg. It, yeah. it was like, oh, I somebody asked me a question and advocated. 
And I went, yeah, that's a worthwhile thing. And I said it at a production meeting. And the next thing I knew, it had changed. Yeah. It was that simple. We needed to talk about it, and then we needed to implement it. And I hear what you're saying, but I also think that that systems change when people change right. them, mm -hmm. and that there are so many, it's like before Harvey Weinstein came tumbling down, we all thought nothing could ever change in Hollywood as regards gender. Mm -hmm. And now it's like, oh wait, 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 <laughs> stuff can change. And now we're like, hey, can we change this too? You know, and I think that, 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 that using, yeah. that, that Finchie was brave and advocated, mm -hmm. and she advocated for her community, and mm -hmm. and uh, and to uh, to willing ears. And I was able to to then a a do something on the show yeah. that was easy to do, but I think so often people are afraid to advocate. And I know this from for a long time. I was trying to say get female directors from studios. This mm -hmm. was years ago, and there would be female upper level studio executives telling me you know, approvable female pilot directors is a really tough mark to hit. Mm. And I would be saying, could you go advocate, could yeah. you go to your male boss and advocate? And they didn't want to because they don't want to be seen as a problem or seen as a woman who's only advocating for women. And it's, so it's a systemic brokenness. And the more of us that get brave enough to ask the question of can we change this, the more change will happen. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just quickly say, can I just quickly say, um, I don't want to give Hollywood a, a heart attack, but the CDC last August came out with the statistic that one in four people in the US have a disability. Um, so I say we don't have representation until on screen, every one in four people on screen have a disability. So mm. I would agree with that. I think one of the things that, uh, if I could just jump in on this, I think one of the things that baffles me is that diversity, and inclusion is good business. Yeah. It's Great good business. content. Yeah. I mean, I've been blown away at how people have reacted to this docu-series that we've done on Hallmark Channel. And RJ's the one they all ask me about. Mm -hmm. they, want, they, they love to follow him. They want to know, you know, if he's ever, if he's ever gonna date. And how they, old is he? He's 21. 21. So and you know, when he was three, muscle. he was told he would never do any, he's, he, he would never do all these things. His diagnosis day, we sure. call the never day. And then, you know, just methodically just sort of check these nevers off of his, you know, that he would never drive, that he would never have a job, meaningful employment, that he would never live on his mm -hmm. own. And he won't ever live on his own because I won't let him go. <laughs> but that's my own personal issue. Oh, my. Um, I, 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 I can't, can't, let I, can't let him go. Can't let him go. You got to go. <laughs> he was I, fooling me. Oh, my uh, gosh. Ooh. I can't. I can't. But Put him but, out. Put him out. No, I can't. <laughs> out. I can't. Holly, put can't him out. do it. Um, he he just I I need to sleep at I'm night. I'm gonna talk to Rodney. Yeah, you call Rodney and talk right. to him about this. <laughs> but it's good business. Uh -huh. It has made the show stand out. It's something that people look forward to seeing. And then everyone, I go in the airport and they're like, oh my son has it, this is giving me hope. This is for years the only reference we had to autism was Rain Man for decades. Right. right. And I and I didn't even realize that until I, my son, I was like, because that they, they smart as yeah, they a have, whip. They don't, oh my God. Take them to Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I don't want to make it too academic, but there's this academic named Alison Kafer. Wake up, everybody. Um, and she has this thing called Imagined Futures, and it's this theory, and it's exactly what you're describing. And it's that collectively as a society, and then individually, like within our own families or when we go to schools, et cetera, we just can't imagine disabled people having a future other than one that is bad and sad and ends in us helping them commit suicide. Right. Um, and if we can't imagine it, then we're not gonna be able to do it. And so again, that's why I applaud Hollywood and media saying that you guys have an important role because you guys are putting out there a, few, a different kind of future for people with disabilities that maybe mm. hasn't existed. And if we can get that into people's imaginations, then maybe we can get there. And then sort of rounding back yeah. to, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, um, what you said about diversity, I agree, I agree. But one thing that I've noticed, it seems that diversity 
is over here and disability is over here. Mm. Like they're two separate conversations, but in fact, they're really the same conversation. They overlap, they're one conversation. And not to minify, minimize the experience of people with co people of color um, or, or people with disabilities, um, but it is the same conversation. But why are we afraid of that? We've come a long way with diversity, I think, yeah. We're not there yet, but, uh, but we've done better with diversity in terms of um, representation of color on screen. And so, uh, you know, there's only three. Imagine uh, the percentage of women on TV, if you can imagine, like, 3% of anything on TV. It's We have to make that one conversation in order to pull it up. I don't know how we do that. I don't have the answer there, <laughs> but it needs to happen. I, I don't know if we're going to move on from this conversation, but I believe, one of my one of my beliefs, you know, disability doesn't discriminate. There's anyone in this room who doesn't have a disability, you could leave here right now, or be in this lobby, or be in this room, and have a disability in the next 20 minutes. It doesn't matter where you come from, it doesn't matter your family, it doesn't matter what you believe, your money, or how much you are affected you by it, exactly. And there is a disillusion of the <laughs> able body, quote unquote, because again, we all have our own things, maybe physical, maybe mental, maybe financial, maybe family, friends, that affect us in a way that, that define and challenge who we are as individuals, but we have a disconnect of the medical field, of our own humanity and how we present ourselves. Because if you take someone that's not in a wheelchair and then you say you're going to be in a wheelchair, they will refuse that idea. They will, they will go, that, that's not going to happen. That could never happen to me. And it can. And then after the fact, they go through a period of either embracing it or rejecting it and learning out who they are. And this goes through any facet of our existence. And then they have a whole new way of viewing it and go, oh my God, why didn't I ever believe in this or understand this before? And we, that's what we're trying to enable into these individuals is that understanding and that capacity of, of this is an everyday individual. This isn't the, the abnormal individual. This is humanity. This is what we are. This is what we represent. And the nevers and knows and can'ts and won'ts mm -hmm. are their limitations. Not the limitations of your kids, not the limitations of you, but that individual's limitation of how he perceives who he is and what he can do, but not what you can do. And we're told by professionals, we're told by doctors, we're told by individuals that, that have power or influence that this is it. And you accept it. We accept it. We accept that ideology and go, okay, this is it. And then one day we get fed up with this is it. We get fed up with this is the best it's going to be. And then we go and we, we go a little bit deeper into the water and go, wait, I, I, can, I, I, I can swim. I can do these things. I can, I can reach these people. I can, I can actually like, have a life and friends and, and work and carry jobs and, and be part of society, not, not a disabled to society, because that's how a lot of people either view them or feel that they are viewed. And that takes... Proving and showing who you are as an individual, stepping out, creating shows, being that pillar in the, in the community for your, your family and what you're doing and following that dream and, and making the shows and defining that and, and really being able to create that world. And as much as there's so many things that we, we can do and it starts here and it starts here and it starts here and there's so many aspects of that, but we can't all go through all that. But each one in here, you can, take a, you can take a part of that and help bridge that gap and put a brick down because it, it's going to take that. And then it, through that, we'll show what our humanity is. But that's what we're fighting, is it's our humanity. It's, it, it's not just our disabilities, it's not just our diversities, it's not just what we come from or where we stem from, it is our humanity that defines us mm -hmm. and that we are fighting against that and protecting ourselves. But you gotta put yourself out there. Mm. So. Put yourself out there. I remember when I was uh, on a show called 21 Jump Street so many years ago. Yeah. It was uh, 
very iconic show. And uh, I want to say second season, maybe second or third season, an actress named Jerry Jewell came Yeah, on. I love I did a movie with Jerry. Did you? Yeah, I, I'm going to give it a little plug. Joey Travolta, many of y'all might know. We shot a movie in a week and a half, a full feature, with 75% disabled crew and cast, Woo. front love. and behind. Wow. Love. Yeah. It, it was done easy. I could compare it to any other movie that I've been on. No difference whatsoever. Wow. That limitation of, oh, it's going to hold up time. It's going to do all this. It's, oh, we got to fit crew and cast. We did not have an accessible house. We did not always have accessible locations. But we made it work without complication. Mm -hmm. And that's the key. That's the key. I was just thinking of Jerry because um, I love that she's still working, and you know we worked in the '80s, and it was just like she came on and she played this cop, yeah. and she was a cop with you know disabilities, and she killed it. I mean, and then she she's was, the best. and everybody kept trying to, oh, can I get that for you? Can I do this for you? She's like, I got this. So she is amazing, and I, you know, this was in the '80s. I thought. Wow, and I had just sort of joined show business, and I thought, boy, we're going to have, this is going to be, we're going to see, she's going to have her own show where she's going to be the lead, and she's going to be, and that didn't happen. You know, and then 35 years later, you know, we're at least having these conversations. So I think that the, the good news is we are having these conversations. And Jerry's still kicking everyone. Yeah, she is. <laughs> she's she is, grinding. She's amazing. I love it. Um, how are we doing on time? Are we getting, uh, we're getting closer? Oh, there's, there's my yellow... Thanks. Okay, so, okay, so we're, we're, we're getting close, guys. I, 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 want, I, want to, I want to pose a question, especially to you guys, because it's I was having an interesting dilemma, and it was the fact that I worked 15 years able-bodied. Then I worked 15 years disabled. It was, and, and you start thinking to yourself, because you start, just like I'm, I'm listening to RJ talk. RJ is going to get a job because one, he easy to look at. <laughs> <laughs> it helps. It, 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 it's <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I had a, a head, I was proven as an actor before I had my accident. So the average disabled person just trying to get it. I think it's a it's a different animal. It's a different animal, and I and I and I think about it because sometimes, sometimes I'm, I'm gonna be honest. I feel funny sometimes if I do these diversity panels because I'm like, dude, you, you know, in my mind because I wasn't born like this, mm -hmm. so my mind it doesn't compute a lot of times as a disabled actor. So I don't know, it might be a benefit, you know, but at, but at the same time, does it make me think at other actors, you know, not putting your best foot forward? Because I'm, I, I, you know, I'm a, I take that same attitude, but at the same time, the chair, believe it or not, added a whole nother dimension to me as a as an actor i, I come in now with a prop can i respond to that excuse uh, me can i respond to that of course. are you done yeah 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 because <laughs> i'm i'm really posing i'm asking a question for myself you know i what think I mean? that's a great question and i feel like we've addressed really uh putting these non-specific disability roles out and encouraging disabled actors to come in but i I don't know, bear with me here. I, I kind of feel like that's problematic if that's the only approach we're taking because I think the roles that are already written are written from typically a non-disabled perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and if, if what we're saying is we just want these disabled actors to come in and become more normalized, um, then I think we're doing a disservice to disability because disability itself, um, I mean, the, the simplest definition of disability, I believe, is difference being different. And I don't think that's in a negative way. I think a lot of people go straight to the negative thinking. I think we need to celebrate that difference and celebrate celebrate um, disabled culture and the way that disabled people are. So I think that, I, I, I think I'm hearing what you're saying. Because what you're saying is, is true. Because I mean, most of the 
I got to say all the roles that I went for or went in meet, meeting for, they weren't disabled. No. But once they saw me, which plus, like I said, I'm already proven. So they see me, they see what I do. They all, oh, we, they, they'll make it. This, it. So it was not like it was a role written for a disabled actor. Mm -hmm. So that's the point where I'm getting at. We, what you're totally saying is and I think the definitely there, write the roles. I think the solution there, or, or at least complicating the problem, is not that we just have a bunch of disabled actors come in and audition for these roles. I and mean, we need to change all the stuff behind the scenes. I don't have all the words, but like the writer's room. That's the, the best well, thing about that episode I did. We need to get disabled folks on that end too, disabled. because then we're because then we're that's getting authentic representation oh, right. written. Mm -hmm. so I think that's that where it starts. But like in the creative John, do you aspect. have any... D it, it would it, help. Yeah. Is that something that's realistic um, to have, you know, more representation in, in what you're doing on uh, an scripted show. And who are we hiring? <laughs> but you're doing an unscripted show, but I mean, just as far as, and we know we talked about crew, but as far as people in the creative realm, in the writer's room. Yeah, I mean, I think we have to say to people with disabilities, you should think about, you know, being a television writer. I mean, you, you, you know, I think we have to go to the Correct. schools where these people come from, and we have to somehow, you know, develop this pipeline and open up mm. the possibilities because, yes, it would be much better if in, you know, the various writers' room that there was more diversity. It just can't be a bunch of white guys from Harvard and Yale. I mean, you know, they have to bring in more life than that if they're really going to be able to tell great stories. Yes. Mm -hmm. And there are inclusion programs mm -hmm. uh, and they have as limited as they are in certain ways. They have changed the town in the 20 years that I've been writing and producing TV. It was you know, there's a real shift in inclusion and those programs had an impact and one of the things that the studios did is they would add to our budget. So we weren't firing somebody. They would yeah. say, here's a little extra money, we'll pay for you to bring in a person who doesn't look like everybody else in your room, whatever that might mean. And I think whether, whether people living with disabilities need to be encouraged toward apply to those programs or whether a whole new program needs to be. Yeah. Well, they just need to go to the same schools and have the same dreams so that, you know, You've got, a kid in a, you've got a kid in a wheelchair or a kid in, you know, who's deaf, who's going to Harvard and wants to be a writer. There's more to it than that, <laughs> but, though, because yeah. I, didn't, I didn't go to Harvard and I didn't, uh, I, my degree is in in-screen writing and uh, I self-educated as a writer. And I, and I had this experience recently on Twitter where I was giving the advice that I always give when people say, I want to be a writer, do I have to have a degree, what do I have to do? And I, I said, um, no, come, move to LA. You have to move to LA, and then you have to go to whatever parties you get invited to, and then you have to <laughs> hand your scripts to the assistants, who, uh, not to the EPs, to the assistants, get them to read them, and you make friends, and you read each other's scripts, and then somebody makes it, and you help each other up. And that's how I got in, and that's how so many of wow. the writers I got in. And somebody wow. wrote back and said, you left out one part. Uh, you have to be white. Mm. Mm -hmm to follow that advice. And my first impulse was... I'm trying to stay away from that. Uh, yeah. My first impulse was to, to say, hold up, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, I have a lot of friends who are people of color who... And I stopped because I realized that every friend I have who's a person of color who works in Hollywood in a writer's room has a degree in screenwriting. Mm. That I was giving advice from my white privilege that I could come here and go to parties and my able-bodied white privilege, I could come and, and I had never stopped and considered that the rules are different for different people. And so I say, I think that there's a lot of different ways to skin this cat, but it can't just be, you've got to go to Harvard. It, there, that, that we do have to create more of a pipeline for people. Um, to, to get in. And I know we don't have a lot of time, but the one thing is, is, in, in, yeah. <laughs> but, oh boy. But when, even when I first started, when we started, the industry is not what we're in now. This beast, yes, people with disabilities, sometimes we, we have a bigger beast with us that, that, that carries us through this thing. But the industry now has changed. New media is here, new platforms are here, new abilities to, to not that, yeah, when you're hitting that wall and when you're, when you're being 
marginalized or discriminated against, you don't have to go that route anymore. You don't have to go the traditional, I have to go to school. And actually, I got so, I got heckled by so many of my castmates over the years by not going to college and <laughs> not having this thing because that was the formula. Mm -hmm. That was how you made it in the industry was you went to these schools, you did this thing, and you hung out with these kids, and all their kids go to the same school, and then we take that, that group of kids, and then they all are sons of executives. So, of course, they get hired in the executive office. And now I've seen where, yeah, we still have to deal with that. But a lot of those kids are being fired. <laughs> a lot of those people aren't making the cut. That they're, 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 they're hungry for what we are offering here. They're hungry for what everyone else here is hungry for. And it's now we have the ability to, to get ourselves to the table, to, to present ourselves. So when we finally meet that opportunity and we are in the position to actually claim power, that we can claim it and we can hold it and that we don't lose it, or it crushes us. Because that's what happens, is people get the opportunity, but they don't always execute it. And then that opportunity goes from a, a day player, working a couple episodes, to four, how many years now? You said four? Six years. Six? Five, going on six. six. Yeah. And just got picked up. And just yeah. got picked up. Well. No, don't do it. Go like this. Uh, yeah. Hey, yo, pass some of that here. Send some down the line, man. So listen, we are, we've run out of time. This has been a, an amazing panel. Um, I just really appreciate everyone in the room for coming here today. I, I, I love doing these things because I learn, you know, probably the, I've always been one of those child first people language, you know, child first language. And, you know, I used to cringe when people would say, RJ was autistic, and, that you, and then my girlfriend Tisha Campbell Martin, she oh, has yeah. a son, and she's like, "Oh, that's my autistic son's dad." And I was like, "Wait, wait, wait! What do you mean? That's not child first, you know?" So that my I learned so much about the the, the, the broad spectrum in mm -hmm. the disability community. It's and you said ask how someone wants to be identified, yeah. and then take it from there. So that was my takeaway. I, I am so thrilled to be able to talk to all of you. I think this was an awesome panel Man, it went too because fast. we really covered every angle. Um, really great. covered every angle. So Catherine and Jonathan, Shoshana, RJ, um, Chill and Krista, you guys, I just, this is, this has been great for me. And I want to thank Easter Seals. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to thank the Television yeah. Academy for, for, for putting this on. We should have more conversations like this. Mm -hmm. um, we should have more uh, diversity and inclusion uh, across the board. I think it's great business. I think it's excellent business. Um, and this has just been great. Is there anything anybody has to, to in, say before we leave? Any parting words? You, everybody's good? I, I want to say, yeah. say one more thing about reaching out and creating opportunities. I have a friend, Joan Rader, who... Uh, created a, a television show with a trans character, her son is trans, and she wanted a trans writer in the writer's room. Couldn't find, couldn't find an unemployed trans screenwriter. Wow. And so she reached out to a novelist she loved who was living in Maine through the publisher, called, called up that novelist <laughs> and said, do you wanna come make Hollywood dollars? I have a television show and I need a trans writer and your words are so beautiful in a novel form, I'm sure I can teach you screenwriting. And that's how she got that representation. That's how you make it room. happen. That's how you make it how happen. Make it and happen. I do think that it can't always be about the that's traditional it. pipelines. We that, have to reach right. out and help people outside in. the box yes, got to, got to this to. system. Sometimes yeah. you have to create that pipeline. Really, maybe it's Easter Seals would be mad at me for saying this because we haven't announced this. We were going to announce in May, but my writing partner and I are the only two deaf people in the WGA. Wow. That's, uh, yeah, well, I'm sorry. It's so silly. It's ridiculous. There are deaf writers out of there, out there, but, um, you know, we just partnered with Easter Seals uh, for a writing competition for deaf and hard of hearing writers to help develop them, to come and see them. Hopefully we can partner with them with those people, um, with industry people here. 
um, that'll help these writers to get feedback and they can maybe become writer's assistants or whatever they are, whatever they need. We have to make the pipeline and sometimes you have to get out there and chop down the trees yourself, you know, to get the, the road cleared for them and mm. then maybe that other person will move forward and do the next step. We just have to start somewhere. We've got to try it and then, um, you know, there's maybe if there's too many trees out there, you can't see the path. We got to start chopping down the trees and then others will follow once the path is cleared for them. All right, well, we're going to chop down some trees. Yeah. And all right, all right, chop, see y'all. Chop, chop, chop down some trees. <laughs> and um, sure. I, I just wanted to give a plug since I'm the common person up here. Um, if the industry is so in need of finding people with disabilities, um, there's a big activist community of folks with disabilities who are talking about these issues too. And if you're ever in need of folks, much like myself, <laughs> plugging myself, but other folks, if you don't know the name Ellis Wong, for example, the Dis Disvisibility Project, um, and so many countless others, we're out there. And, um, you know, we, Lawrence Carter Long, LCL, I mean, I, I can go on and on. <laughs> I'm getting the red light, but, um, you know, connect with us. I mean, we're out here. Um, awesome. We're well, out here wanting to connect so with you. Thank you so much to everyone for this great panel, this great night.